Desperately, helplessly, longingly, I cried. Quietly, patiently, lovingly, God replied. I pled and I wept for a clue to my fate. And the master so gently said, Child, you must wait. Wait? You say, wait? My indignant reply. Lord, I need answers. I need to know why. Is your hand shortened or have you not heard? By faith I have asked and I'm claiming your word. My future and all to which I can relate hangs in the balance. And you tell me to wait? I'm needing a yes, a go-ahead sign, or even a no to which I can resign. And Lord, you promise that if we believe, we need to ask as we shall receive. Lord, I've been asking, and this is my cry. I'm weary of asking. I need a reply. Then quietly, softly, I learned of my fate. As my master replied once again, you must wait. So I slumped in my chair, defeated and taunt, and grumbled to God, so I'm waiting, what for? He seemed then to kneel, and his eyes wept with mine, and he tenderly said, I could give you a sign. I could shake the heavens and darken the sun. I could raise the dead and cause mountains to run. All you seek, I could give, and pleased you would be. You would have what you want, but you wouldn't know me. You'd not know the depth of my love for each saint. You'd not know the power that I give to the faint. You'd not learn to see through the clouds of despair. You'd not learn to trust just by knowing I'm there. You'd not know the joy of resting in me when darkness and silence is all you could see. You'd never experience the fullness of love as the peace of my spirit descends like a dove. You'd know that I give and I save for a start, but you'd not know the depth of the beat of my heart, the flow of my comfort late into the night, the faith that I give when you walk without sight, the depth that's beyond getting just what you ask of an infinite God who makes what you have last. You'd never know, should your pain quickly flee, what it means that my grace is sufficient for thee. Your dreams for your loved ones overnight would come true. But oh, the loss if I lost what I'm doing in you. So be silent, my child, and in time you will see that the greatest of gifts is get to get to know me. And though off may my answers seem terribly late, my wisest of answers is still but to wait. We don't like it when God says wait, do we? And you know, many times that's what prayer is all about, waiting on the Lord, trusting him, taking these burdens that we carry and giving them to him and saying, God, you do the work. Lord Jesus, you're faithful. You can do it. Trusting him. And prayer is merely communicating with God. Getting to know him, getting to know who he is and his faithfulness and his goodness. It really should be at the top of our list of priorities, but so many times prayer is last on the list. So many times we may even find time for Bible study, but we don't find time for prayer. And prayer is so essential. We know that Jesus is our example for so many things and especially for prayer. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And I want, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, not 2. Chapter 1. I always say 2 and it's 1. And I want, to, I want you to look at verse 32. And this is um, right after Jesus' ministry got started and his disciples had been called. And um, so... Verse 32, at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. 
and there he prayed. Now, Jesus was ministering to so many people the night before. I can't even imagine how tired he must have been. Just even ministering, it takes so much out of you. And I'm sure it says so many were gathered. The whole city was gathered at the door, and so many were healed. And yet, what did he do the next morning? He got up early before daylight, and he went to that solitary place, and he prayed. Now, I probably would have said, Lord, I've been so, you know, you've been using me uh, last night, and I am so weary. I need rest. I just need to stay in bed a little bit longer. But that's not Jesus. He needed to know his Father's will. He needed to know his Father's directions. And so many times throughout God's word, we see Jesus early in the morning going to pray. We see him going in secret to pray. We see him on a mountain praying. This was so essential in his life, even to teach the disciples how to pray. They asked him, how do we pray? And he gave the Lord's Prayer, which is like a skeleton of how to pray. Jesus rose early and went to that solitary place to pray. Now, it's interesting because verse 36 says, Simon and those who were with him searched for him. It's kind of like, hey, Jesus, it's happening. The ministry's finally get on, getting on, and people are here. They're waiting. They want you to come minister to him. Where are you? And it's kind of like, you know, sometimes... We that are married are looking for our husbands. Where are you? I needed you. I needed you right now, and I couldn't get you. My husband hunts for me. <laughs> he, calls, he calls the church sometimes looking for me because he wants me to make him a sandwich. But anyway. <laughs> but here's Simon and those who are with him searching for Jesus. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Kind of like, where have you been? But he, Jesus, said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. When he spent that time with his father in the morning, in that solitary place, his father gave him directions for the day. And it's so essential that that is what we think of our first thoughts in the morning. Lord, I want to give you my day. What would you have me do today? Where would you have me go today? Who would you have me to be with today? Should I do this or should I do that? Taking that time, even before your feet hit the floor, to order your prayers to the Lord. Turn with me to Psalm 5. Psalm 5. And you'll recognize this psalm as a song we sing. You almost, it's hard almost to, to read it when you want to sing it, you know. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. In the morning, O Lord, I will direct my prayer to you and I'll look up. In other words, you're focusing your eyes and your heart on him. First thing, prayer is difficult. It's something that the enemy does not want you to do. And he will do anything to keep you from it. I was just talking to someone. They said, I was doing fine. I was dressed, ready to go. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel good. And then I realized, who's trying to keep me from going? (laughs) The enemy. He does not want us to talk about prayer. Prayer should be at the top of our list of priorities It is a door for God to do a glorious work. Prayer will turn back the tide of evil and enable you to do battle against the evil forces around us. Prayer is the most potent weapon that we have in our spiritual arsenal. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. Because we are in a spiritual battle. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that wiles is the schemings 
his uh, schemings that he has against us, very systematic schemings, schemings to keep us from praying, keep us from worshiping God. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You know why it's hard to pray? Because all of this is coming against us when we pray. He does not want us to spend time in prayer because prayer is so essential for our walk with the Lord. Prayer is one of those spiritual weapons. And he goes on, he gives, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I can't stand in my strength, in my power, in my ability. I have to stand in the power of the Lord. And he has that power for us, but we need to partake of it. And then it goes on, of course, to give the spiritual armor, girding your waist with truth, breastplate of righteousness, your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then look at verse 16, 18. Praying how often? What does it say? Always. Is God's word lying here? Praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Chuck Smith said, prayer is the most potent weapon that we possess in our spiritual arsenal. And by it, strongholds of the enemy can be pulled down. But most importantly of all, prayer is communicating with God. That's how we get to know him. Aren't you thankful that we have one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus, and that we can go right to him. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. And look at um, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can, cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus, of course, was God in the flesh, but he chose to be human with all the things that we experience, all the things we go through, the temptations, the trials, the weariness, all those things. And what was his answer for all of that? prayer. He would spend time with his father in prayer. Let us therefore, because we have him as our high priest, because we have him as our mediator between God and man, that's why we pray in Jesus' name, because it's only because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that I can enter the holy of holies and go right to the throne room of God. Isn't that awesome? What a privilege we have. What a privilege we so many times don't take advantage of. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. That's the only way we can come to the throne is by the grace of God. Come to the, through the, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How many of you need mercy? Woo. How many of you need grace? We need it so abundantly to be able to walk this walk as a believer. And that's why we come before the throne of God, asking him, oh, Father, strengthen me. Give me what I need, Lord, in this battle that we're in. I want to talk a little bit about the blessings of prayer. Number one, a deeper relationship with God. Deeper relationship with God. It increases our faith. I can't tell you how my faith has been increased as I've prayed for something and then I watch God do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything I could imagine. Uh, my daughter was coming back from Belgium and they were um, needing funds to get their, uh, the few things they were going to bring back. 
and some of the ladies got together and we had a, a garage sale. And you know, garage sales, man, you made me make $200, $300, whatever. But we prayed. And you know what? God gave us $1,000 from that garage sale. He was so amazing. And you know, the thing is, we knew it was God. I was there and I watched people come and they'd pay 50 cents, 25 cents, 30 cents. That doesn't equal $1,000. But you see, God was multiplying it over there. That's the way to go. He's so faithful. He's so good. That one we got to see. And I'll tell you what, it increased our faith. Remember the election, Pat, uh, President Trump? Oh, my, we prayed and prayed. We had such a, such a, just a, felt like we were just sent by God to praise for that election. Pray and pray and pray. And then to see the outcome, which nobody thought would happen. Isn't it incredible what God did, seriously? Because I think if we'd gone the other way, we'd be in a heap of trouble. But he's faithful. He's so faithful. He increases our faith. He provides a place to unload our burdens. So many times we carry these things around and God says, come to me. Just give these things to me. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. I can't even tell you when we come together in prayer because we have a prayer group that meets every Tuesday at 930. I'm giving a plug. It's here at the church. It's in uh, F3. Listen, so many times we come heavy laden. And when we spend that time in prayer, I can't tell you when I leave, I always feel like burdens have been lifted. In fact, many times I don't even want to come. Have you ever noticed that about prayer? <laughs> you can think of all the things you need to do instead of praying. But when you do, casting those cares upon him. I know sometimes at night I lie in bed and all these things are running around in my head and I can't go to sleep, I can't go to sleep. And all of a sudden I think, oh, what am I doing? I need to pray. I need to take those things and give them to him because he is faithful. And I've seen God so many times be so faithful and lifting those prayers off of me. Teaches us God is always near. I don't have to be in a special place. I don't have to say special words. It's just communicating with him just like I communicate with my sisters. You know, um, when uh, my daughter was in Belgium, it was really important for her and for me that we communicated. And praise God, we had FaceTime. And every day we would be on FaceTime because she was very lonely. She was going through a lot, and especially this past year. But just having that time of communication, just, you know, she would kind of tell me how she was feeling, what she was going through, and I would pray for her, pray with her. Think about our God. Having that time of communication with him, it's like having FaceTime. But the cool thing is when I call him, there's no, nobody saying he's not available. He's always there. You don't get, uh, I can't talk right now. He's always there, and I can call on him anytime, any place. He's always near. It also trains us not to panic. Because, you know, when situations first come our way, our first response is panic and fear. But when we think, oh, the first thing I want to do, I have a little sign out there that says, pray first. Pray first. Go to him first. Because, listen, the truth of the matter is he's the only one that can deal with the situation. I can cry out to him anytime, any place. He changes lives and attitudes. He can change your attitude. He can change the attitude of others. I remember when my one daughter was walking away from the Lord. Oh, my. I learned early on my words weren't going to change her one bit. It was like, she didn't want to hear it. However, I could talk to God about her. And I watched God change her. I watched God's Holy Spirit woo her to himself. It's the greatest thing we can do for our children, for our grandchildren, for our neighbors, for our friends, for our fellow church members. Take them to the Lord in prayer. God is so faithful. I used to think, I wish I could get in her brain and rearrange it. And the Lord said, you can't, but I can. And he did. And he brought her to himself. 
He's so faithful. And sometimes I can have a really stinky attitude, right? Uh, there's a book out called Sporting Etude. We can sport a tude, can't we? I saw this uh, thing on Facebook the other day. It's a little boy, a little four-year-old boy, and he was mad, and he was like that. And his mother started singing some song, and at the end of the song, you go one, two, three, four. And he was like this, and he goes one, two, three, four. You know what? When we go to the Lord in prayer, he can do that for us. One, two, three. Ah, oh, Lord. Okay, I'm back on track. He's so faithful. I think my husband wishes I'd pray more, you know, because I can have an attitude. And it changes. It changes me. Number two, greater purity. The awesome thing about prayer is that's when I can go to God. It says 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James 5, 16 says this. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, I can confess things to you, but you can't heal me. God can. And that's why it says not just the confession part, but the prayer part. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're only righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? It's because we've asked Jesus into our hearts. He's our Savior, and he gives his righteousness to us. So we can all claim that we're a righteous man in this. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's God's word promising that. But the problem is we don't go to him in prayer. And therefore, we don't see the action that God wants to do. Number three, confidence in making decisions. Um, Isaiah 30, 19 and 21 says this. It promises that God will be gracious to us at the sound of our cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. He wants us to cry out to him. He wants to give us direction. He knows what his will is for us. And I love to go to the Lord and say, God, is this what you would have me do? Father, I'm going to start moving in this direction. And if you don't want me to go this way, please stop me. And he will. That's the coolest part. God is faithful. He knows where he wants you to go and what he wants you to do. You can have confidence in making decisions as you seek him. Matthew 7, 7 and 11. 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And then verse 11 says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Listen, God loves you. He's saying, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. That's what he desires us to do. Number four, improved relationships. When we're praying for people, we can't hate them. Prayer changes us as far as that goes. In Matthew 4, 40, I mean 5, 43, it says this. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's the most awesome thing. When my daughter was killed, this verse became very, very real to my husband. Because he hated that man. He wanted that man dead. And he read this verse and he said, no, I must bless him. I must do good to him. And I have to pray for him. And I'll tell you what, God then enabled my husband to forgive that man. God doesn't want us to withhold that unforgiveness. As we pray for others, especially those that we're having a hard time with. You know, God puts people in your path many times that are difficult. But why? Maybe he wants you to pray more. 
He wants to do a work. He wants to show you his faithfulness. And you know what? God can, God can change us. I remember one time I hurt a lady. I did something wrong. And I, it was real humbling to go back and say, I'm sorry. And I did. I went to her and I said, I am so sorry. I was wrong in what I said or did. I can't even remember now. It's so long ago. And then I said, will you forgive me? And she said, no. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. But you know what? I had to say, Lord, I give it to you. I can't change her feelings. I can't change her mind. But I give it to you. I don't want to have a bad relationship here. I want to, I want to have that between us, that forgiveness. And I say, Lord, I did what you told me to do. I have to trust you with the rest. Well, a few days later, she came back to me. And she said, I'm sorry. I was wrong. That was kind of cool. Ooh, she had to tell me she was sorry. It was good. Anyway, but you see, God, God knows what he's doing. Sometimes he'll put a difficult person in your life if you're working or uh, whatever. I'll never forget, we had a, a lady in our church in South Louisiana, an older lady, and she was a difficult person. She just kind of rubbed everybody the wrong way. And I'll admit, some of them were praying she'd leave the church. <laughs> that wasn't the answer. But... You know what? As we prayed for her, God began giving us love for her. And that's what she needed. She just needed love. It's just an amazing thing how God can change you as you're praying for that difficult person in your life. Number five, prayer brings contentment. Somebody said this, if he doesn't meet it, you didn't need it. And that's true. Am I going to be content with what's going on in my life. Be content with where he has me. And that's a hard thing to do. Many times when I'm discontented, prayer is the only answer for me to go to the Lord and, oh, God, give me your contentment that I'll be content with the, th the way things are. Um, my life in, our, in my marriage, we had a very difficult marriage, and there was a time when I had no love for my husband at all. And I said I had to pray consistently Father, you do the work. I can't change him. He can't change me. You do the work. Well, let me tell you what. God did an amazing work. He showed me me. He showed things in my life that I needed to take to him and get him to work on. He showed things in my husband's life. I, w I could tell him all day long, but God showed him. And when God showed him, God did an amazing work in his heart, both of us. Both of us coming to the ends of ourselves. That's what God did as we prayed. And God was faithful to restore what the canker worm had destroyed. He was faithful to bring that marriage back together. Prayer is a ministry with the power to change lives. To change my life. To change the life of others. Prayer keeps us from disobedience and temptations. Um, one of the parts of the Lord's Prayer is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Have you ever prayed that for yourself? Uh, last spring, I got on a diet, and I, it, was, it was the keto, you know, where you don't eat bread. And I, I craved bread. I mean, bread was in my dreams, you know. <laughs> I want that bread. I want that bread. And I'll tell you what, when that craving would come, I'd just have to say, oh, Lord, lead me not to temptation. Deliver me from evil. I prayed that so much, and God was faithful. I just should have kept it up in the summer, but anyway. <laughs> but he is. He's faithful. He, he wants us to, to pray about these temptations. Prayer can open doors for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. Colossians Four, verse 3. I would have us look all these up, but we have such a short time. I just want to read it to you. Pray for us. Paul's writing this. Pray for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. There are three types of prayer. I want you to turn with me to 1 Timothy. We just finished 1 Timothy. But I want you to turn there to chapter 2. 1 Timothy. Chapter 2. And you'll remember this when we read it, verse 1. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul is exhorting Timothy, 
supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. There are three types of prayer. The first one is ministering to God. Ministering to God. That results from a conscious awareness of God's presence and to want to have communion and fellowship with him. Who he is and what he has done inspires us to worship. Knowing him, knowing who he is, knowing what he's done in our life should inspire worship in us. To realize his greatness, his wisdom, his power, his loving kindness, his goodness. When we start our prayer group, we always start out praising him, thanking him for who he is. Realize his greatness. Realize his nearness to me. Oh, God, you're near to me. Because of your grace, I can have a relationship with you. Realize his love for me. What a thing to be thankful for. This brings forth worship as we start contemplating who he is and what he has done. Psalm 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, what he's done for us, and into his courts with praise. And praise is who he is, what he's done and who he is. Thank him because he's my deliverer. Turn with me. Well, don't turn. I'll just read it. Psalm 33, 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Thank him. Oh, God, thank you that your eye is on me. Thank you that you, you're protecting me. You're watching over me. You're delivering my soul from death. Going through the Psalms is a great way to worship the Lord, great way to pray to him. Just reading Psalm after Psalm, giving praise to him for all it says. Uh, adoration and praise, thinking of the greatness of God and how incredible it is that he should hear us at all. Psalm 18, 1 through 3. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and fortress and my deliverer, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, praising him, adoring him, worshiping him. The second type of prayer is supplication. Remember it said in 1 Timothy, uh, supplications. What is supplication? Supplication, of course, petitions, asking God for something. But supplication is primarily, primarily prayer for ourselves. Confession, coming to God, confessing, oh God, forgive me. In the Lord's Prayer, what does he say? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive me of my sins. Come in before the Lord. Your, Lord, show me my heart. There's stuff there. Sometimes you may think you're so okay, but then he'll show you the truth about you. We don't like to see the truth, do we? But it's so great when the Holy Spirit reveals to us things there that shouldn't be there, attitudes that are there, and going before him in confession, supplication, bringing my needs before the Lord, asking him for help. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. He cares about your needs. He cares about everything that concerns you. And he's there for you to... Cry out to him, oh, Lord Jesus. I'll never forget when we were moving to California. And we, I was, look, I mean, uh, Colorado from California. And I was thinking of the cold. And I had a prayer journal. In fact, I've got that old prayer journal right here. I got so many prayer journals. This one, so old, it's ugly. I didn't want to put it out. It's so ugly. But it's full. It's full of prayers that I prayed and prayed and prayed. And one of those prayers in this book, I could even show it to you. It was, Lord, prepare us for Colorado. It's cold. <laughs> well, I forgot about the prayer. And a friend invited me over for lunch. And after lunch, she said, did you see the big bags at the front door? And I, I said, yes, I did. And in all honesty, I thought maybe it was some hand-me-downs because her daughter was older than mine, and she used to give me her clothes, which were really nice. Anyway, she said, those are for you. Okay. In those bags were electric blankets for our entire family. God heard that prayer. 
He answered that prayer. And you know what I love about a prayer journal? I would write in there the date and the prayer request, and then I have on the other side answer and write down when God answers. That'll, incur, that'll increase your faith. It's so awesome. And so many times I forget things. I need to write them down. I need to have them before me to be remembering to pray. And so I have a lot of prayer journals. I'm, I'm serious. I write down prayers all the time. Go to retreats. People ask me to pray. And I write little pieces of paper. And I get home. And I just, I just put some in my current prayer journal. Prayers that people asked me to pray while I was at a retreat. I also have this other thing that helps me remember to pray. And it's here in my Bible. And what it is... You see that picture right there? I think I've shown some of you this before, but it's a picture of a, a Navy um, dormitory. Weird. Who gives you a picture of their Navy dormitory when you're a total stranger? Well, I was on an airplane, and there was a young Navy guy next to me. He had tattoos everywhere. He was a tattoo artist, he told me. And then he proceeded to tell me his parents were Christians and they didn't like his lifestyle and da 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 And I'm like, why are you telling me all of this? And then he pulls out these pictures. See, this is my dormitory. This is what your money provided my dormitory. Here, keep it. Why would I keep his picture of his dormitory? Because the Holy Spirit told me, you are to put that boy's name on the back of that picture and you're to pray for him. His name is J Jason Whipple. I've been praying for him for years and years and years. And I'm going to see him in heaven. I believe that with all my heart. And then I started when other people would give me children to pray for. This is my children picture. All these kids' names on here. Praying for them that they'll come to know Jesus. Here's another picture. This is a family. This is Gerald Hageman and his family. He's a pastor in Joshua Tree, Calvary Chapel pastor. His wife right here. My dear friend, she's in heaven now. She gave me this picture of her family. She died with um, uh, pancreatic cancer. She's happy. She doesn't want to come back. <laughs> but this picture is what I put uh, marriages, different marriages. People ask me to pray for their marriage. I put that on there to remember. To pray. And these things are so ragged, but I keep them because it reminds me to pray for these people. Supplication is praying for ourselves, crying out for wisdom, for guidance, for discernment, for strength, for, for, for provision. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burdens upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Psalm 34, 4, Tell him everything. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. When you have fears, go to him. Take them to him. He's the only one that can do that. Uh, children have bad dreams, and, and they're afraid of things, and you can take that to God. Uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 34, 4, tell him everything. I sought the Lord. Oh, I read, just read that. And verse 6 says, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. As I partake of his grace, his love, and his power, then I have strength to move forward. Prayer is necessary to prepare and equip and beautify us inwardly daily, daily. How much time do we spend on the outward man? We spend a lot of time, don't we? Yeah, we, we wash it and we perfume it and we cream it and we do stuff to the face. It's amazing. How much time do we spend on the inward man? How much time do we spend in prayer? Do they have equal amounts of time? So many time, times we say, I don't have time to pray. Well, you do. It's just wanting to do that, having a desire to go before him in prayer. And the awesome thing is I can be putting on my makeup and praying. I can be talking to the Lord in the shower. I can be talking to the Lord anywhere I go. See, it says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. It's not, Lord, I'm praying, now that's it, and I'm not going to pray anymore today. No, it's an ongoing prayer with the Lord, ongoing talking to him. When things come up, bringing it to him. It's so awesome to have that relationship with God. Now, the third type, I already, I already ran into it, is intercession. And that's when you are praying for others, interceding for others, like 
the couples and this single boy and these other single girls, praying for others, so essential that we spend that time in prayer. This type of prayer can bring conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For many times, we're praying for someone to get saved. We're praying for um, God to do something in a life that's very seemingly impossible, but God is faithful. We can go to battle for family, for friends, for neighbors, for co-workers, for the body of Christ, for the unsaved. Paul continually prayed. I'm going to give you three times that Paul prayed for people in the church. Uh, Ephesians 2, 15 through 21. These are prayers to study and memorize. Ephesians 2, 15 through 21. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. I love these prayers. They, I just can't even tell you how awesome it is to pray for people in this way. And this is what Paul prayed. He prayed for the Ephesians, for the Colossians, for the Corinthians. These are prayers that he prayed. Verse, uh, Colossians 4.12 says, Laboring fervently for you in prayer. When we enter intercessory prayer, we step right into the battle and we, we begin to fight against Satan's strongholds. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Satan has strongholds in all of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We saw that in Ephesians 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but guess what? They're mighty in God. Hallelujah. For pulling down strongholds. These are areas the enemy has found a place that he can lodge. We have strongholds in our lives. Others have strongholds in their lives. And God can take them down. He can do it. He's able. But we need to bring them before the Lord. And then it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Bringing those thoughts captive. Is this thought from God? Is this thought from the enemy? Is this thought from the world? Is this thought from my flesh? And as we get to know him, we can discern which ones are from where. And is this a thought that God would not have me think? Is this a thought that my daughter has been believing that's a lie from the pit? Oh, Jesus, I bring her before you. You know that daughter I mentioned that walked away from the Lord? You know how she came back? She was at UCLA, and she was so rebellious at that time, she said, I'm going to take all those liberal courses. She took all the feminist courses, and she was sitting in class, and the Holy Spirit started working. Woo-hoo. Sick the spirit on them. That's the best thing. And he started talking to her, and she started saying, what they're saying is a lie. That's not true because she was raised. She knows the word of God. It started welling up within her. This is not true. And she went and bought a Bible. Woo! That's what you want them all to do. Go buy a Bible. And the Holy Spirit started speaking to her, and she started witnessing to everybody. She started standing up in class. They didn't like that. You know, God can do it. Even in the worst situations, God can do it. He is faithful. There was a man. It's, what, it's my favorite book. It's not out there on the table. I put those books out there for you to just kind of glance at and maybe one you might want to buy yourself. I don't have enough to give out. But just some ideas about books on prayer. My favorite book I can't find. I think I lent it to somebody, and I'm going to get another one. It's called Rees Howell, R-E-E-S Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L, Intercessor. It's my favorite book. And Rees Howell was an intercessor during World War II. He had a school of prayer. And they were praying not knowing what was going on. And at that very time, the Battle of Dunkirk was taking place. 
The British soldiers were all on the shore. The Germans were all up here ready to come down and kill them. They were going to fire on them. And at the same time, Rees School of Minister of Prayer were praying. They were praying. They were interceding for the country. Nobody gave the command for them to go and attack these soldiers. And fishermen brought their little tiny boats over and were able to clear out all those soldiers from that shore and they were not killed by the enemy. That was a God thing. Rees didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what God was doing. But listen, his prayer, God was giving him wisdom to pray and God was interceding for the country of England. Had the Germans entered into England, it would have been all over. God did a mighty thing through prayer. Truth, Satan's already defeated. Jesus has triumphed over Satan. Thus, Satan must yield when we come to him in the power and authority of Jesus. Jude 9. You know, Jude doesn't have chapters, just verse 9. Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. I am not rebuking Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, as you come against this and that and the other. Pray specifically. Satan will be persistent wanting us to get discouraged and to quit praying. If answers don't come immediately, don't give up. Luke 18.1, he said, Men ought always to pray and not faint. Hallelujah. Keep on keeping on. Keep praying. Uh, look at James 1. We're gonna, I'm going to hurry. James 1, verses 5 through 8. I, can, I need about two days to, to really cover this uh, because it's just, there's just so much there. But listen to this. James 1, uh, verse 4. Let patience have... Oh, no, excuse me. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. In other words, God's not going to say, Hey, honey, your prayer request time is up. You've asked enough. I'm not going to do that for you. No, without reproach. He's not going to say, Well, you haven't been praying recently. Why should I answer you now? Uh Uh-uh. You can come. Lord, forgive me. I've been prayerless. But, oh, Jesus, I need wisdom right now. Just come before him. Don't let anything in your life hinder you from coming to him. Just come. Forgive me, Lord. I want to move forward. That's another trick of the enemy. When you've done something wrong, you don't want to go before God. Oh, I can't ask God about that. I'm such a sinner. Well, it's true. You are. But just go to the Lord. Satan's the one keeping you back. So he says, come. He's not without doubt. uh, Excuse me. Let him ask of God who lives liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We can go before the Lord. Prayer is limitless. It can reach around the world. Remember, we're talking to the divine creator of this entire universe. Why do we limit God? We limit, we limit him because we're limited, but he's not limited. He can do anything. Mark eleven four. 4, what things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Nothing is too hard for him. God is our source of strength. Prayer is the means through which he gives us strength. John 16, 24, we mentioned already, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And, and last, God commands us to pray. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Sometimes sin will keep us from prayer. Sometimes self-condemnation. And you know Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you know what that means? For those who are born again. It, it doesn't have that last part that says who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Walking after the spirit means born again. There's no condemnation for us as believers. Uh, Unworthiness. Sometimes we feel unworthy. Well, 
Read Ephesians 1. It tells you your, your position in Christ. You don't have worthiness, but he's the worthy one that we have accepted as our Savior. Uh, sometimes we don't want to go, no, go to God when we're upset, but that's when we really need to go to God. He's our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. It says that in uh, 46, 1, Psalm 46.1. Many times the hindrance to prayer is laziness. Laziness. We must do it. Our idol worship. Now, sometimes, you know, we read in the Word about the idols that they made of wood and stone. Well, we have idols too, don't we? Our social media, our TV, our, uh, our, maybe our crafts, our, who knows what it is. But when we're play, too busy playing with our idols, then we don't have time to pray. Sometimes you feel hopeless. You've given up. You haven't seen answers. And, and you don't want to pray anymore. And then, and then it says uh, in um, Hebrews 6, so after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Hang in there with prayer. Unbelief, you don't know God's love and care for you and others, and that sometimes causes us not to believe, not to trust. Dryness in prayer. Pray anyway by an act of your will, not by feelings. We can par- compare this to an earthly marriage. We stay committed because God's word says we're to be, and sometimes we don't feel like being committed, right? But we still do it. And that's the thing. You may say, I don't feel like praying. It's okay. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. He'll change you. And lastly, sorrow that has become depression. Sometimes when things get so bad, we don't want to pray. We just, we just want to go to sleep, kind of like the disciples when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. What were they doing? They were sleeping. It was just too much. And I, but I love Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Um, there are some handouts out there. One is just verses on different things you're praying for, on salvation, backsliders, his will, husband and wife, marriage, divorce, pastors, employment, singles, all those verses there that you can pray. Pray that scripture over that person. Uh, another thing that I gave is by this lady, an older lady. Um, she gave just some hints on setting up your prayer time. I can't find it right now, but it's there. Yeah, they have it. Okay, good. Uh, one last thing. There was a man, and let me find his thing here. He was in the 1850s. He was alive, and he had a burden for prayer. And so he rented this little place, and he kind of let the word get out that he was going to have a prayer time at noon. Well, three people showed up. And he said, well, the Lord said, if, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So he prayed. Well, the next week, 40 people showed up. And that was very encouraging to him. i got to find that paper. Where's my paper? Da, da, da. I have too many things in my hand up here. <laughs> Come on, Jeremy, where are you? Well, I don't know. Jeremy left. I don't know where he went. Let's see. One more look. Well, I don't know what happened to him. But anyway, it started a revival. And long story short, department stores in New York started shutting their doors at noon so people could come pray. The stock market went bonkers. The banks started closing. All these things started happening, and people started desiring to pray. And they started coming together in prayer, and revival spread across the land. Hey, one person, one person. Prayer is effective. God can do it. Okay, Miss Brenda, come on. I don't know what happened to Jeremy. I lost him. Oh, well, I'll find him. Oh, there he is. I found him. Yep, Jeremy. Yeah, wow. Something else. All the banks fell. The third week of his prayer meeting, 40 people came, asked that for daily meetings. On October 10th, the stock market crashed. People began flooding their prayer meetings. Within six months, 10,000 people were gathering daily for prayer in New York City alone. 
Other cities began having a renewed interest in prayer. In Chicago, the Metropolitan Theater was filled every day with 2,000 people praying. 2,000 assembled for daily prayer in Cleveland. St. Louis churches were filled for months at a time. In February 1858, the New York Herald gave extensive coverage to the prayer revival. Horace Greeley sent reporters to only 12 meetings and counted 6,100 people on their knees. Woohoo! Lay people, not church leaders, led. Prayer rather than preaching was the main focus, and it led to the third great awakening. You never know. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't that powerful? Grab that, grab that microphone. I will. Groanings of the Spirit. Okay. I forgot to mention, Jesus is praying for you. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. And the Holy Spirit is praying for you with groanings too deep for words. Isn't that powerful? Wow. That's amazing. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. That was really good. It, it kind of reminded me that where you finished there. Do you remember 9-11? Like all the churches across America were packed, packed. for months. And yes. it's yes. just amazing that sometimes when things happen to us, that's when we get on our knees. I watched the strangest documentaries, and <laughs> I was watching one on prisoners being locked up uh, last night. And it was interesting because they were talking about the ethics of um, putting them in the box, and that's like a solitary room with no windows and... So there's all this discussion and legislation about what should we do about this? Is it effective? Is it really making it worse? And um, it was interesting because time after time when they went into isolation, they would contemplate their lives. And a lot of them like would deal with God because here they were like alone with their thoughts. They didn't have any distractions. Or So it's interesting how God sometimes he needs to get us alone to like have those thoughts. One question that I had is, um, clearly you've had a life of prayer, but what could you share, like, how did you establish that in the beginning? Like, when you were a young believer, um, what were some things that you did? Obviously, we see some of that evidence, but what was it that got you to really focus and, and make that a part of your daily life? I think it, I think it was needs, personal needs was one thing that led me to pray a lot. And also, um, my husband was a pastor. I married a pastor. And the needs of the people of the church. And I can remember being young. I can't do this now, but I get down on my knees and pray for situations at the church. You know, there's where you've got people, you've got situations. And that, that was one of the real forces. I think adversity in life is what really, really gets us in pray, into prayer. Don't you find, too, that as you were younger, I think that when you're first a believer, you have a tendency to just sort of pray for the things that you need or, you know, you know the practical things, my marriage, my kids. But then as you get older, you realize, like, the specifics that you can really go yes. into, yes. Um, even changing other people's hearts, changing situations, like asking God, you know, for that. What was your plan for prayer, like, early on, or maybe even what, what's your plan for prayer now? Like, do you get up in the morning and pray? I mean, you talked about praying without ceasing, but for someone who's just like, gosh, I, I'm, I'm trying to pray, but I think when we do those, like, oh, I'm in the car praying, we're not really that specific. Um, maybe it's at the moment, but mm -hmm. how, how could they maybe have a plan for, like, something specific? Um, as I said, I think it's essential that we start in the morning, even in bed before we get out. But then to have a consistent time, I have stations in my house, I call them. Um, I have places where I have my prayer journal, my prayer journal, I have my Bible, I have a notebook, and I have pens. And so wherever I am, if I'm upstairs or if I'm downstairs, I have a, a designated place that I can go and pray. And then these prayer journals, I have a multitude of them here through the years. But having prayer journals to specifically write prayer requests um, and what this prayer request is. And then, you know, you don't every day go over the same request. You, as, you, as it builds and you have a lot of requests, you, you summarily go over it. Um, and 
just to see God do the work. When, in our prayer group, somebody, uh, Joanne, brought us each a book like this. And so when we come together in our prayer group, we jot down the prayers that we pray in the prayer group. And these are prayers that I go over and, and pray over. It's just kind of evolved, you know. But the thing is to have that in your heart to recognize how important, how essential Jesus did it. If Jesus did it, we better do it because if he needed it, we need it even more. And I just think just to say, Lord, give me a heart for prayer. Give me a desire to pray, to, to bring things to you. Because so many times I didn't bring up the one verse that we talk about a lot, and that's Philippians 4, 6 and 7, where it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made, be made known to God. And what does it say? The peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart. And I think we desire that peace. Prayer is the... the mm -hmm kind of the road to peace it really is and I think sometimes we think about prayer for our daily needs and and that is obviously true but think about it from the standpoint of eternity and we know that for yeah. the loss that there's eternity in the balance but then I think about just the rewards that we'll gain in heaven I was just reading about you know the crown of righteousness and the crown of life and the crown of life is given to those who resist temptation well how are you going to resist temptation through prayer? prayer you know so there's an eternal value absolutely um, an amazing internal well and value. god gathers those prayers in heaven that's amazing god gathers those prayers in heaven and every once in a while he'll let the prayers out it's the incense it's like you know remember when right before the holy of holies they had the altar of incense it's it's like a fragrance to god when we pray it blesses him when we pray it's so essential I remember when the kids were young, we made a, a, it was a thing back in when I was younger in the 80s, 90s, that you prayed for your kids' spouses. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's a good plan. Um, so from very young, when our kids were born, we just prayed like, Lord, you know, so then when someone would show up, we would know like, you're not the one I prayed for. <laughs> like we were able to say like, so then we would work on praying them out. And we had, Ted and I, we had this thing that like, we would count how many days, like we would, you know, we would specifically like, Lord, we know that's not the guy we've been praying for. And we would just pray him out. And the, the fastest one was 13 days. And our, our daughter came in and, you know, she's sobbing. He broke up with me and Ted's behind her back like, yes. <laughs> like finally, Thankful. that one's gone. But just specific prayers for your children, character issues that maybe you're dealing with your kids with, praying through those, you know, things in our marriage, deep things in our marriage. One of the things before we go to questions that I wanted to ask you is, what do you say to someone when God says no to something that they really want? Maybe a, a pregnancy or maybe, you know, a marriage or, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, how hard do you stuff. deal with that, the hard stuff? Well, I think that's where it's so important to know God in his word also. Because as we know him, we know he knows what's best for us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And it's hard. It's difficult. And he understands that. What did, it, what did we say? read in Hebrews? It says he um, empathizes with our weaknesses. And it's hard. That's one of our weaknesses. It's hard to accept no. And yet to know and realize and have faith that God knows best. We don't understand why he might say no, but he knows best, and he wants the best for us, and have that belief. You were talking about praying for your children, and I did. I started praying for all my children when they were born for their spouses. And my one son-in-law got saved. Um, uh, he had been, he was an adult, or he was in college when he got saved. And when he asked my daughter's hand in marriage, I said, you know what, Wayne? We've prayed for you since before she was born. And he started crying. He said, I didn't know the Lord to pray for her. And I said, that's okay, because I prayed enough for both of you. <laughs> so it does. And I'm thankful for my son-in-laws. Well, Gloria has a microphone down here. And so we just wanted to take some time to be able to just have a discussion. And, and so ask some questions. and Because we'll, I'm sure if you're thinking it, then 10 other people are wanting that question too. So if you have a question, just raise your hand or stand up and she'll grab the mic for you. What I'm wondering about <clears throat> um, is 
is um, fasting and prayer. And on, on that, <clears throat> I just want to ask, when, sometimes I hear people say, you know, your prayers are going to be heard better, number one, if you fast, number two, if you're on the floor on your knees. Is there any truth to that? And, and I know that he says, when you fast, I'm just wondering, do you do it? Do you, how long do you fast? I, I'm, I'm just curious about how to pray in that respect. Well, I know Jesus said there were certain things that would only come out by prayer and fasting. So I think it, it is because what is fasting all about? It's actually saying no to your flesh. And, and it doesn't even have to be food. It can be fasting. I'm diabetic right now, so I, I, I have to be careful about fasting. But I can fast not eating certain things or I could fast not watching TV that day, or you know what I'm doing? It, what it is, it's just when you fast, it brings to remembrance, oh, I'm setting aside this time to spend with the Lord in prayer for this specific need. And I think it, it, it's more um, attitude. It, it brings your attitude and focus. And boy, your, your body is going to scream when you're fasting. It will. And that's okay. Yeah, you want to add and it's that. kind of like an alarm clock when you're yeah. fasting and you feel that hunger pain. Then it's like, to me, it seems like an alarm clock, like, oh, I'm going to pray instead right. of going and getting something to eat. Um, I've, I've done fasts from like sun up to sundown. Um, I've done fast overnight. I've never done, uh, anybody ever do like a 20 or 40 day I fast? I, I've never been able to do something. Have you? I anybody? Have. Anybody? No. Uh -huh. I mean, that's hard. I've known men, pastors who have done. Have you I done? I have. Well, then I'm like Shrek. I have. I have. The donkey. Go. Yeah. 40? Yeah, yeah. Whoa. 40 yeah. days? Yeah. I was young. I was young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. And what, I mean, tell us about your experience. With that well, it, um, it, I was reading a book about that and about fasting and the fact that you can go for 40 days and then on the 40th day you need to eat because you're, then your body will start eating itself. Um, but I didn't fast from water or anything like that. Because um, you can only survive without water seven days? Yes, seven water, days. You, don't, right. you don't do that. You have to have water. Um, but um, it really was a very, very special time. It was. It really was. It was, it was uh, hard at first. But then it's almost like your body um, gets used to it, and it's not as hard in the middle part. Um, and we know the whole story of Jesus when he fasted in the wilderness and how the enemy would come mm -hmm. and attack him. But um, it, was, it, was a, it was really, really good. I was praying for specific things in the church. I was praying about my own health. It was for my health, too, just oh. different reasons. Anyway, yeah. no big deal. But. I was noticing when we were reading Mark... Um, it said in the morning that he got up, and but then I noticed what he did at night. It said at night, in the evening, they brought all the sick and the oppressed, and he was able to cast out demons, and he was able to do these things. And I thought, that's why he was able to do those things, because he got up in the morning. And a lot of times we think, wow, Lord, why are you using you know that person to do this or that person to do this? And like, are we coming prepared in prayer? Every time you teach, I know that you come prepared in prayer, every time that we meet, you know, our leaders, we come in, you know, having that preparation of being in the word, prayer, going, having God go before us so that he can do something supernatural in our midst. If we just come and expect him to do something supernatural and we really haven't spent that time in prayer, how much can we really expect him to do? You know, we need to be coming well, to prayer. he's faithful a lot of times when we're not. Of course. But the cool yeah. thing is, how much more can he do as we're yielded to him in Amen. prayer? And remember our Bible study, it'll always say, pray, you know, before you do your study. Because you'll receive so much more from it as you've centered and focused on him. And it's kind of like saying, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm just giving you permission to teach me, to show me, to guide me. Yeah, Amen. that's good. Other questions? I hope that answered your your question. Did that answer your question? Are Liz? you going to answer or ask? <laughs> uh, 
this is not a question, but I would just recommend a wonderful book. It's been out forever. I don't even know if it's still in print, but maybe on Amazon you can get it. But it's called God's Chosen Fast. I have it out there on the table. Okay, good. Yeah. And you can I look at the think, cover. I think the author is Simpson, isn't it? But it covers a lot. I, I, I can't remember exactly, but it covers all different kinds of fast. And I know a lot of friends have um, done a fast called the Daniel's Fast. Yeah. Uh, in the book of Daniel where the children of Israel were brought in as captives and they only ate fruit and vegetables and they were better off than the other slaves that were brought in with all the goodies. So uh, that's one way of fasting too. I've done that one too. But also, um, well, I won't go into that. Go ahead. It's okay. So it can be, it can be a, I mean, I know people who do weekly fasts that like um, every Monday they yeah. fast. I know people who fast daily up until noon. I mean, there's a, a lot. Of, it's not about the the legalism of how we fast. It's just that we're doing it on a regular basis. Le Is on the legalism of yeah. 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 It's yeah. It's not about. I well, mean, even we like fast getting on our knees to pray. You know, sometimes being on your knees to pray is a means of concentration. You know what I mean? Uh, that it's not right. necessarily that that's any more holy. And not if I got on my knees to pray right now, I probably wouldn't get up. I'd have to pray somebody and it come would help me. <laughs> you know? But You'd I think it's more the new prayer more the knees. when you're on your knees. Maybe you're not falling asleep. Um, I know there was one guy that would he would always pray standing, because when he would sit and start praying, which is typical, isn't it? We fall asleep. I've done that so many times. But he would stand because standing up, he didn't fall asleep. I fell asleep once. We were having a Spanish prayer meeting. And because they were speaking in Spanish, I couldn't understand it. So it was like <laughs> white noise. I literally woke up as I was like. <sighs> <laughs> like, yep, I'm in the middle of a Spanish prayer sleeping. But when it, we, when it, we I don't were, think it's about posture. It, yeah. When we were at the Bible college, we had a little group of marrieds that would come over. Um, and we, at the end of our time, we would pray. Well, Justin would always close in prayer. Well, this one time, different couples were praying, and then everybody finished praying, and we were waiting for him to close in prayer. And we're all with our eyes closed, and pretty soon everybody's opening their eyes. He was sound asleep. <laughs> and the funny part was somebody kind of made a motion or something, and he went, oh, Lord, thank you. <laughs> Hoping we didn't notice. Yeah, that's a better way to get out of it. Think of that, the prayer where that man is standing and saying, oh, Lord, you know, I'm so glad I'm not like them. And what was the other one? Oh, what was me, Lord? You know, just coming before him humbly. Questions. Even practical stuff. There's one with Rosie, and then there's one all the way in the back there, Gloria. Um I, you know, when you were saying the prayer book and you put in your prayers for, you know, that people request prayers, right? And so is there a rule of thumb about, you know, you, because you get so many during the week, you know, do you pray for that, those during the week? And then the next one, you start with more prayers or you tack them on or, you know what I mean? I'm not sure if that's a... Yeah, you, you can get a pretty big list that way. Yeah. Um, when we have our prayer group on Tuesdays, we get a list from the church and we pray for those that Tuesday. The next Tuesday, we pray for the new list. But sometimes they're lingering things. Um, say, for instance, maybe we're praying for somebody who's been very ill. We have a lady in our church who's been very ill, and she's an ongoing prayer. Um, and then it'll be brought to our attention, oh, they're doing a procedure, and we pray for that. Yeah, it's just, it's just however the Lord leads. But like I said... In my prayer journals, I have certain things I've been praying for years. And I don't, like I said, I don't pray every day for them. But I, periodically, I'll go through and pray over those prayers again. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really a wonderful way to just see God work. And that encourages you to pray. And also, there are all kinds of things like here. Um, this was a missionary prayer book a church put out to pray for the missionaries. And my daughter happened to be one of the missionaries, so I was praying in that through that. Um, many times, the, the persecuted Christians, uh, there's a lot of prayer things that come out. I have some on the table back there to be praying for them. I pray for people in the Sudan and pray for uh, persecuted Christians around the world, the martyrs. 
um, just a lot of different arenas to go into, praying for our missionaries, finding out who they are, and praying for them, just so many things. So great. There are so many things we could pray for, and I think sometimes when we do journals and we start getting lists, then we get overwhelmed. Yeah. And so I That's think true. having that freedom that, look, I'm going to yeah. just pray and ask the Lord, which ones of these do you want me to pray? Yeah. I mean, do you think it's a bad thing when you have a long list, too, to just say, Lord, I lift these up to you? No. I mean, I, he's God, right? He's the creator of the universe. He can take, sometimes I'll be praying for like a church or, oh, the church is in the area. And I thought, well, he's a big God. I can pray for the churches in the world. Amen. Do you know what I mean? Like, why stop there? Like, it, it's the same amount of time. So yeah. big God, big, big prayers. We have a question in the back. And that's the thing. Don't get under, uh, le don't get legalistic about it. Right. Just as God leads you. That's the thing. This works for me. It might not work for you. But just, just let God lead you. That main thing is you pray. <laughs> That's what matters. I like keeping the journal, though, because there are things I that I might forget mm -hmm. that I'm really praying about. And then, you know, the next week you're like, I don't even remember what I was praying for. I started putting, um, like, pictures of people I was praying for. If you have a picture like that in that prayer book, I had pictures of missionaries I was praying for. I've got stuff in here, too. <laughs> It all falls You're falling out. apart. That's the story of my life. Falling. <laughs> stuff falling out. I have too much stuff. Janie's going to end up leaving with like pictures from all of us. We'll just keep handing her. I like, want to give her my picture. My family. Now. Send me a picture. I like that. I'm going to. We're all going to text Janie our pictures today. Just be like, pray for me. Uh, Janie, you're, you made a comment about um, when you intercede that. Um, you could bring spiritual attack upon yourself, I guess. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on that. If that's, does it actually say that in scripture, that kind of thing? Well, you know, we read those two portions in Ephesians and Corinthians that we are in a spiritual battle. And I think as we intercede, the enemy doesn't want us to um, pray. That, that's the thing. He's going to come against us. Because we are in a spiritual battle. I think sometimes we forget we're in a spiritual battle all the time. And the enemy is going to thwart anything we want to do as we walk closer to the Lord. Well, think about Job when, you know, have you considered my servant? You know, have you considered Job? Yep. I mean, that was just attacks of the enemy. There's so many different places in Scripture where we see the attacks of the enemy, and especially when you're going to battle in the spiritual realm. Yes. Our battle's not flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. And so when you go to battle in prayer, it's a spiritual battle. Um, but I've heard people also say, oh, well, I don't want to I don't want to pray or I don't want to lead that prayer group because then I'm going to get attacked. That's a, just a lie from the enemy. We are going to do more as we, the, the more we pray, the better, the more victorious that we're able to have God's will done on earth. Actually, he's attacked you when you say, I'm not going to pray because I'll be attacked. You've been attacked. That, right. That's yeah, keeping that is you from a, that, prayer. That's the first Actually, attack. Actually, you're, you're <laughs> under a major attack. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, she had a question here. Um, I'm in a spiritual battle with my 16-year-old daughter, and I was just curious. I thought the journal idea would be great for her, but I think if I introduced it, she'd shut it down because she's in a rebellious mode right now. And I'm just curious, is there some kind of um, workshop for teenagers that can teach them how to pray and... Well, I would imagine, does she go to the Wednesday night um, gatherings? So our junior high and high school, they gather um, on Wednesday nights. And then high schoolers come in here um, into the sanctuary on Sundays. And if you don't know why, um, because we've done a lot of research and kids... Once they finish high school and when they're in youth group, they don't know how to integrate into the mainstream churches, and a lot of them are falling away. St the statistics are astounding, actually. Yeah, so if we can get them into the sanctuary before they leave high school, they actually have a better chance of making that transition. Um, there's a lot of research that's out there on that. But we do have Wednesday nights, and so they will be going through, I know they're going through Romans right now, which is a great book for spiritual growth. 
they're going through that on Wednesday night. So I would, I would encourage her to go. I just saw some pictures on Instagram actually last night and they just, they're, they're meeting at a house, but it's just this really cool house that they're meeting at. It just seems like um, a really good thing. Sometimes our kids would go through rebellious states, seasons, and they would say, I don't want to, I don't want to go to that group or I don't want to go to church. And honestly, we would just say, get in the car. Because here's the thing, they're going to have an attitude at home or they're going to have an attitude there. I would rather take my chances at getting them there and having God speak to them because he's promised his word doesn't return void. A lot of times it's fear, social fear. And once they go and they meet the friends and Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, it's the best thing that ever happened to them. Um, So I would I would I would consider taking her to Wednesday nights um, and just, you know, pray. (laughs) Yeah, they have a winter retreat, I think, coming up that's going to be amazing on the edge um, at the conference center in in um, January. And that'll be the biggest battle because they won't want to go and, and Satan will even attack you. Get them there. God's word doesn't return void and they have an opportunity to meet with the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that, like along the conference um, for the winter. The theme this year is like how to seek God. And so we have three sessions, like one is through worship and then prayer and then the word. And then after those sessions, like we have little workshops that we break into like teach us like, because a lot of times like in the youth, we just want quick, like we're like, refresh my feed. Like I just want to hear from God. And um, yeah, I just encourage her to go to like either Wednesday nights. That's super fun. Or um the winter retreat because it's just going to practically break that down in like a really simple biblical way um and i'll be what's her name okay we'll be praying for her too <laughs> sarah's husband gabe runs on the edge at the uh, conference center so if you have any um further questions to any of you you can ask sarah awesome um one thing for me um that i can say just as an encouragement to you is that 